Okay, good uh, evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, there was a survey I read that was done in America some years ago now, um, which asked people what their greatest fear was. Um, and I have to confess, I can't remember where maths came, but let me tell you, death came second um, of the greatest fears. Public speaking came first. Um, and I'm beginning to think that public speaking at the end of a long evening uh, is high up there. And interestingly, um, I was giving a talk recently where there was a big sticker, and we've got this light here, which is rather alarming. Big sticker on the, on the, on the lectern which said, do not look into the light. I was like, oh God, death and public speaking together. Um, so I want to talk about some work we've been doing. Um, I work part of the time here in England, part of the time in um, South Africa. Working with teachers, and I want to pick up on some of the things that people have talked about, about teacher anxiety. Um, we run a, a series of workshops there. We run math circles, which some of you may, have, may be familiar with, where we invite teachers to come together and, uh, and, and work on mathematics. And we get about 25 to 30 primary school teachers turning up to those. We run these workshops, which we call Hi, I Hate Maths, and we get about 300 teachers turning up. And we do exactly the same content. We don't tell them that it's anything different. Um, but we work on taking some of the fear out of the maths, and I just want to talk about some of the things that we do. Um, the talk was going nasty, of course. I was, I was going to do the Celia thing and ask you to do some maths. I was, my maths task was, what do you think that's a Venn diagram of? Um, and, it, and for most people, it's maths and love. Um, if you search I love maths and I hate maths on the internet, you get about five times as many million hates as, as loves. Um, and hate, you know, I'm, I, I guess some of the things I, I want, some questions I want to raise about some assumptions we might have been making this evening. That we've been talking about maths and maths anxiety, and I'm, I'm kind of equating Margaret had 10% of the people claiming that they hated maths. Um, I guess one question I want to raise is, are we talking about people hating maths or are we talking about people hating school mathematics? Because I think a lot of it comes from what's presented in school and um, poses as maths, um, but is it, is it maths? And what is the origin of it? Um, is it hate? Is it fear? Um, I think probably evolutionarily we've been hardwired to fear some things. I'm, in South Africa, I do meet snakes and I do jump, um, if you were in Australia. Um, but I don't think quadratics have been along quite long enough for us to have developed the fear gene of algebra. Um, so I, I think it's very much a learned response for many people. And again, I think, is it the mathematics that that fear comes from or is it the fear of shame? That I think a lot of this comes from um, the, the fear of being exposed. Um, and that's what we work with, with the teachers that we work with, trying to talk about the shame and the difficulty of it. Carol Dweck, who some of you will be familiar with, of course, is, is famous for her growth mindset work. But she also talks a lot about, um, a, about um, how praise affects children. And interestingly, one of her strong findings is, is a kind of negative effect of praise. So she's got a lot of research that shows that the kind of generic praise that we give young children, like, you're, you know, well done, you're a good girl, uh, well done, you're a, 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 a good boy, um, actually has um, negative effects that we don't anticipate, which is if you, get, if you don't get praise, then they associate that with, with being bad. And so getting things wrong, and a lot of people have spoken this evening about the importance of, of being able to get things wrong and to feel comfortable with that. Um, and so it's about, in the circus world, um, they talk about failing joyfully. You know, when the, when the juggler drops the cups for the first time, they don't kind of slink off going, oh God, I'll never be a bloody juggler. Um, they go to the front of the stage and they, they, take a, they take a big bow. And so one of the things we work on in these workshops is uh, laughter and the importance, not of laughing at somebody for getting it wrong, but laughing with each other at the, at the stupid mistakes that we make. And we set up activities that encourage the teachers to realize that getting things wrong can actually be a joyful experience. Um, I think the other thing that's influencing my thinking in all of this is the increasing evidence that, that I think we are all born mathematical. Um, coming from somebody who trained as a primary school teacher, having done a maths degree back in the, in the uh, late 70s, um, of course, Piaget was very much the, the chief um, theorist that we, that we were taught about. Um, stages of thinking that the four-year-old 
thought in ways that were qualitatively different from, from the adult. Um, I think the evidence now, I'm quite convinced by the research I'm reading, is that our thinking doesn't, the, the quality of our thinking, how we reason about things, doesn't change very much as we get older. And if you look at young children figuring things out, like if I've got a, if I've got a sister called Jane, and I know that my friend Derek has a sister called Jane, and I know I call that girl sister, and I call her Jane, and I call that girl sister, uh, I call that girl Jane, I, I, but I don't call her sister. Children work that out by the age of about four without anybody formally telling them how those relationships and the label sister is in all senses of the word a relative label. Um, and that's basically the kind of reasoning that's behind set theory that you're going to meet later on in maths. Um, there's some evidence now, I understand from the brain research, that the, the bits of the brain that enable us to discriminate our mother from other adults that we meet in our, in our infancy is exactly the sort of thinking and wiring of the brain that leads to statistical thinking later on. So I think we have to accept that it's experiences that's making a lot of the difference here. And Celia very nicely um, uh, used the example of the bat and ball um, question, which is uh, used by Daniel Kahneman, who many of you will be familiar with, his book on fast and slow thinking, the Nobel Prize winning work that he did. Um, and the thing that stands out for me from that work is his finding that um, if you think the answer to that problem is 10p, that's because you've done the fast intuitive thing, because the way it's set up, nine times out of 10, when you hear the words a pound and 10 pence, or 110 and 100, and the word more in the same sentence, 10 is the actual answer. So nine times out of 10, the fast thinking gets you the right answer. That problem is deliberately set up to trip you up, that you have to think differently about it. And everybody's still wondering about the answer. I'm sure either Cedar or I will have a word with you over a drink. Um, but there's the other thing. I have to say that um, we probably won't tell you the answer, because there's lots of evidence that you'll probably wake up tomorrow morning having figured out the answer, um, because the brain will think about it overnight. But the thing that I think is interesting from his work, one of the findings, is this that, this, that switch from being told, no, it's not 10p, into moving into thinking, OK, I've got to work this out. His research shows that that move from the fast thinking into slow, deliberate thinking is often accompanied by a small feeling of depression. <laughs> it's quite normal to feel a little bit miserable. Um, and I think that's quite important, because a lot of teachers say to me, how do I make maths fun? And yes, I want it to be enjoyable, but I'm not sure it can always be fun. And I think, think sometimes we have to accept that that resilience and that kind of commitment and that working on those challenges takes some hard work. I, I had the pleasure of working for a year in New York. One of the teachers there, and I think this is the, a reappraisal thing she was doing, um, was a very softly spoken teacher. And, and I don't know if you'd come across this research, but there's a lot of research which is showing that when we give children challenges to do in mathematics lessons, what often happens, and those of you who teach will recognize this moment, I think, when, when you begin to feel the energy being sucked out of the room, you know, it's just like, if I can get them over this hump, it might be all right. But there's a lot of evidence which shows what actually happens in those moments is rather than addressing that kind of reduction in the energy in the room, teachers actually go around and start to bail the kids out. They start going around and saying, oh, I'll show you what to do, Shirley. Um, because it's easier to make everybody feel good again by helping Shirley get over that hump than by actually helping Shirley get through it. And this teacher, I don't know where she got it from, but the kids would, she'd give them really challenging work to do and she got fantastic results from them. But the way she'd actually established this was in her very quiet, well, her quiet voice most of the time, and the kids would be working on something, and she was just really good at judging that moment when the energy was going out of the room. And she'd suddenly go, how are you feeling? Uh, and the kids all went, confused. <laughs> and she said, and what's confusion? And the kids all went, great. And then she said, okay, back to work. Um, and, and they literally kind of, all that negative energy just got punched out of, out of the, out of, I'm quite tempted since you've been sitting for an hour and a half to invite you to punch the air now because uh, you're all desperate for a drink. Um, but I think that kind of emotional intelligence of, of how we actually, you know, when we had the numeracy strategy where, and we still have it, you know, there's lots of talk about, we have to tell the kids what they're learning. I don't see many lessons where teachers are actually talking to the children about how they're feeling about the maths. And I think we have to get that out and say, this feels uncomfortable right now, doesn't it? Let's, 
let's go for a walk, or let's get our reading books out, or let's come back to it tomorrow. But let's address the feelings of uncomfortableness head on rather than try and sideline them. Let's do a bit of maths to finish. Okay, how are you feeling? <laughs> Great, good, confused, okay. Um, talk to the person, this, this is not my activity, this comes from a, a writer called Susan Lamont. Um, but talk to the person next to you, what fraction is that of the whole rectangle? Just quickly tell the person next to you, what fraction is that of the whole rectangle? Yeah, I'm hearing sixths being muttered. Um, and, of course, um, if I had more time, I would invite people to share how they know it's a six. But, but you start to have to try and picture what that would be if it was replicated throughout the whole, the whole thing. You haven't got... The trouble with most fraction work with children is that they're given something that looks very obvious and they don't have to actually do anything creative. You've got to do a lot of creative. If I could get rid of one word from the curriculum, it would be the word recognise. We talk a lot about recognising fractions. Now, I recognise Mrs. Jones from down the road, but I don't understand her. Um, and I don't, I, I, I've, I've never recognised a, a fraction in my life. Um, you, you, fractions are constructed. They don't exist out there in the world like Mrs. Jones does. Uh, how about that one? Talk to the person next to you. What fraction is that of the whole thing? Yeah, if we look at that, there's four there. This is probably another four there, so that's eight. So 16 to, so two sixteenths or, uh, or an eighth. And what about that one? Oh, of the whole thing. There's not ninth of the whole thing. <laughs> and you're doing quite a bit of mental arithmetic here um, to figure it out. Maths, um, Margaret mentioned in her talk that, that one of her quotes was about fractions. Um, Maths anxiety, I think, often creeps in at two points in the curriculum. Point one is fractions. And if you survive fractions, algebra is the second point at which it starts to unravel. And just the final thing, talk to the person next to you. What would you shade in? What would you shade in on there to show a quarter of a third of a half? <laughs> if you were going to shade in a quarter of a third of a half, where would it be? Okay, and I'm seeing some nice embodied stuff going on. Um, so I think it's it's one. Of, is it one of these? Yes. And what is that? If it's one of those, what fraction is that of the whole thing? One twenty-fourth. And of course, a quarter times a third times a half. If you change those ofs to the multiplication symbol, is one twenty-fourth. So. With not too much grief, I can slip in some multiplication of fractions, which does not come high on most people's love of maths topics. Um, I love maths. I love it because I think it's elegant. I love it because I think it's very creative. But I do like it because of the challenge it creates, and that's what I want to encourage with my teachers and the kids. Thank you very much. Oh.